Despite its ugly appearance, Nebraska came out on the right side of a close game, beating Rutgers on the road 14-13. Can the momentum of a two-game win streak help the underdog Huskers at Purdue? We'll discuss that and more with former Husker Jeremiah Searles. Sean Callahan will help us examine the latest in Big Red recruiting. All that and more next up on Big Red Wrap-Up. Hi everyone, I'm Michael Severe and welcome to Big Red Wrap Up on Nebraska Public Media. Two in a row, and you know what that means. That's a winning streak, boys. <laughs> Jay Moore joining us and of course Sean Callahan as well. It, we talked last week about how it was kind of different for everybody, you know, after a win. Mm -hmm. After two in a row, it's really different. We haven't seen that <laughs> since 2018. What was your feel after the workers win? You know, obviously very relieved. You know, starting off, you know, 13 nothing a half and, and struggling. But there was little things there, you know, that you could hang your hat on. I'm like, God, this could be a lot worse. Mm -hmm. You have to block the punt. The defense yep. does a phenomenal job of holding them to three. I'm like, okay, that is an absolute game changer right there. They go up 14 yeah. nothing. At that point, I'm like, okay. And that's with the Rutgers defense and how, how well, uh, how good they've been performing this year. I thought that it was going to be a tall task for the offense to come back from. But that, that play right there is like, Nebraska's still got a chance because that's a huge amount of changer. You know, the, you go back to all the analytics. I mean, you block a punt in any game, your, yep. your chances of winning goes down dramatically. So having them holding the three was huge. And they just kept fighting, kept battling. You they get some turnovers in the second half. And, you just, and then finally someone else makes dumb mistakes yeah. to lose football games. <laughs> We've been on that side so many times with mismanagement of timeouts, late game penalties. And usually you'd, you'd say, that's Nebraska. No, Rutgers made that. Yeah. Those, and, uh, hey, I'll take it. It, was, it wasn't pretty. It was ugly. This team, I'll take any wins right now with this team. They don't have to be pretty. And I, I'm glad you made that reference because Major League's my, uh, my favorite movie of all time. Yeah, I believe <laughs> it might be Major League 2 that he said that. I'm not sure no, what it's he the, said. It's the first one. It's, it's the first one. <laughs> he said, um, the Jay mentioned it's hard to win a game when you have a block punt. It's almost impossible in a game when the block punt goes for a touchdown. Blaze Gunnarsson's play is maybe one of the plays of the game. Yeah, I mean, if you were to highlight plays of the game, the Trey Palmer touchdown, and that play might have been the two biggest plays. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, some interceptions, but that hustle that Blaze Gunnarsson showed there, because there were a convoy of Rutgers guys around yep. Brian Buschini, almost like saying, Who, who's going to get it? I'm going I'm to get it. Yeah. And, you know, you, you could Red Sharp's see, call, he thought he was scoring. You you know, know, I mean, this guy, if he gets a better bounce there, yep. he's walking in yeah, easily. And yep. the slight bobble there allowed Blaze Gunnarsson. Great hustle. And then the fact that the defense was able to hold strong, like this guy right here should have got yep, 32. it. 32. And, and he's gone yep. at that point. The way that ball bounced perfectly there in that situation. So, uh, Greg Schiano, I forget what the stat was, but the number of block kicks he's had in yeah. his career, it's incredible. Well, anytime you have a head coach that is in charge of special teams, whether his title is or not, it always seems that way. I mean, you got to have a head coach that's very involved, and we've seen that before in the past with Bo Pelini. As always, we need your help to keep the conversation going tonight. Our friends from the University of Nebraska's College of Journalism and Mass Communications are here manning the phones, awaiting your calls as they wait, of course. They are eating some Valentino's pizza. Sports intern Sam, wave Sam. Are you there, Sam? There he is. There's Sam right there. You can also reach us on social media to share your questions or comments. We're watching Facebook and Twitter, so make sure to reach out to us tonight and join the discussion. We have a new sideline survey for you this week. We want you to rate the job that Mickey Joseph has done in the first three games as head coach. Excellent, good, neutral, or bad. I'm 0% bad. If somebody put bad, I'd be upset. <laughs> head to our website right now to vote and then head back each week for a brand new survey. Here are your top plays, Sean. Uh, your first play, your first top play is the interception that ends the game. Malcolm Hartsog bouncing back from a tough first half to make this interception and to seal the game, although there was the fumble on the victory formation, which could have made it worse. Uh, number two, Anthony Grant. Oh, excuse me, Mal Trey Palmer. Touchdown there, a 27-yard touchdown pass after the turnover, sudden change, touchdown right there. And then the number one play on Friday night, Anthony Grant laying the boom on the sidelines, an 11-yard run. I'm not sure what the defensive back was doing here. He was standing straight up. He took the shoulder and elbow to the face, and he went down and didn't get back up. That set the tone for the entire second half right there. Big time, big time physical, no doubt. All those plays were exciting. We're going to break down a few more by joining Jay Moore, who's now inside the huddle. Jay. All right, before we get into the main game highlights, let's take a look at a couple plays here um, that I wanted to break down. Early on, I love this play from our offense. If I can get this 
I think we're, the remote is, <laughs> there we go, now we got to work. Um, they get it down here, I love the play action. It's gonna start right here with, uh, with vocal, and I love the, the pulling action and the great play action here. It's just a good look. You get a hard play action fake, boom, everyone's freezing. You get vocal that squeezes behind, and I, it's really, I gotta give uh, Casey Thompson some props, because the, 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 fa the handoff <coughs> and then get the laces to make a good throw, Really good ball handling by him. And there we go, Nebraska gets on the board. Volkolek gets a touchdown at his old school, Rutgers. Nebraska on the board. Next play. I like the action here. Nebraska brings in a blitz, getting to, getting to the quarterback late in the game here when they had to make a stop. So we, I'm highlight down here on the bottom. Nebraska shows six on the defensive line. Essentially, they have their six. But you're going to have Heinrich going to kind of bail out late. When he's going to go man to man on the back. But as we run this here, Tanner kind of wraps around, and I highlighted Heinrich with the, with the man to man. You have Tanner here. Colton Feast is going to come wide open through this. Does a nice job, kind of stay on this tackle's hip, forces him to stay out. The tackle probably should have came down to take a most dangerous man, MDN as we call. And then, this is a really hard place. This is really good. I've been there many, many times. When you come, when you're unblocked and making a sack in a quarterback, it's a lot harder than what it seems. He does a really good job of just getting enough cloth to get this guy down. And then you're going to get Garrett Nelson's going to come on top of this and, get, and finish this thing out, I think. As is, <laughs> as the, there we go. As the play finishes, rallies the play. Nebraska gets, uh, gets another stop, and Colton Feist gets his, I think, first sack of the year. Sack on that. You gotta be upset, Did he? right? You gotta be upset to get a half. I think they shared that sack. Oh, that's all cool. Yeah. I think they shared that he sack. Should, uh, he needs to be on Garrett on that one. That was all him. Six total hurries that I counted. I'm not sure what the official number was. Was it about Rutgers' offensive line, or do you think Nebraska did things differently to get more pressure? I think they, they kind of showed a, a little more. They brought guys up mm -hmm. into line of scrimmage, line, the linebackers, and that kind of forces the, the, the offensive linemen's count. How they yeah. kind of, and so that forces your eyes a little, you know, in different scenarios and different situations. And if you can just get that a crease, a half a step here and there, that's that's all that's all you need as a as a pass rusher. So they just had some different things. And I mean, they're not the best offensive line. No, that's not the best offense they're going to face mm -hmm. by any means. But it's building confidence. That's what this defense needs to do right now is you got, you'll take any confidence, any positive play they can get right now and keep building on that because now we're getting into the meat of the season. Yeah, Sean, real struggles in the first half offensively. What do you think the biggest issue was? I just, you know, the, the protection up front. I mean, yeah. if you can't block with the run or the pass, it's really hard to get into a flow. And I think Mark Whipple had a hard time just finding – the right flow to for this offense. I mean, Anthony Grant, those 47 yards he had were hard fought. 40, 45 of those 47 yards came after contact. Casey Thompson on the game was pressured on 26 of 38 dropbacks, yeah. and they only blitzed 11 of those 38 dropbacks. Um, so it really puts into perspective how hard, as you said, they had, you know, you identifying number counts and bodies. I mean, Nebraska was just flat out whiffing on guys up front and um, it, it just Casey Thompson. The fact that he was only sacked one time was was an amazing stat in this game, knowing how much he was pressured. And Lewis is really good from Rutgers. I liked him. Yeah. Seventy-one. He, that guy's gonna be playing on Sundays. He is he is a really good football player for Rutgers. Whatever. I don't know what Greg Shannon does if it's if it's a recruiting thing or it's a development thing. But he always finds guys. Even the first time he was there. New England would draft a lot of Rutgers guys because they knew they were ready to go when they got to the NFL. He's, he's either a really good developer or he just finds those gems that are pretty good players. And they have that edge. I mean, even on the kneel down, the final play of the yeah. game, um, and I don't know if Nebraska wasn't aware of, like, Shiano's history, but, like, I think everybody was kind of surprised. Well, even, in, even in the pros. In, in the, the pros. Tampa. He did yeah. it to Eli Manning. and mm -hmm. like, The fight broke out after that. After that, yeah. <laughs> I was standing next to Sip, like, watch this kneel down. It's going to get interesting. And yeah. Donovan Riola ran out there and, and had some words, and some of the Nebraska coaches were pretty upset because yeah. that thing, I mean, Casey Thompson was, like, trying to hold oh, on to the was... ball. Yeah, he barely brought it back in. But, you know, you got to play the last play of the game. you got to expect that. Just because it's victory formation doesn't mean they're not going to play. Well, you could, I mean, in the – this, you know, that's you're, we've been taught that as defense Shotgun. alignment. I mean, you're you're sw when he's, you're trying to swipe for the ball, do anything to disrupt it because if they got that ball there. It, what they got, there was enough time. What, there was there was 40 seconds on the on the play or on the time clock. So they get the ball back, field goal, game winner, Rutgers win. So I mean, I can't. You're not. If, now if it was completely on the other side of the field on their 30, whole different. You know, side well, if of you're the story. Up by two touchdowns or something. Like that yeah. too, but that. That was, they still had a chance to, you know, technically win the football game. Back to back games where Nebraska's defense shuts them out in the second half, but that's without Newsom. Reimer was out. It was a really good impress, uh, real good 
performance with two of their best players not playing. Yeah, and they forced the turnovers. I mean, that, that was what really jumped out, uh, the interceptions that we saw in this game. But the no points, um, they've, they've bowed up against the run, too. Uh, we have not seen very many just breakdowns for the long 40, 50-yard run. And, and that was the theme in the first three, or three games of the season, yeah. how many breakdowns we saw with alignment issues. They've done a very good job, Bill Bush has, of cleaning those things up where at least guys are in the right spot. And I think that makes a big difference. There were three or four times where guys were in the right spot. And there was a screen. Uh, there was a run to the left. Caleb where, Tanner's missed tackle. Yeah, guys are in the right spot but didn't necessarily make the tackle. But it's not like it was in the first four games. Oh, no, no, no. I mean – what we've seen in the first four games was yeah. that was some of the worst defense I've ever I've ever seen. Period. They are this. You can tell it's just simplified for them. They it's I don't I don't know exactly what Chins was Chinander was trying to get to them. I don't if it was extremely complicated or what it was. If they had trying to be perfect, multiple, trying to be that's probably is one of the situations. If they had multiple calls at one time, I'm not sure, but they just look like they they trust where they need to be. They have trust within the defense. I, before, they, they look a little hesitant. They, they, they trust each other as first and foremost, and they trust what they, what they got to do, and it shows. And they made a move. Not every coach is going to pull a guy, especially if he's a transfer or a portal guy, like Tommy Hill, and move him and go with the freshman. Making that move, even though Hartzog had some struggles in the first half, Tommy Hill was getting beat a lot at cornerback. Yeah, we haven't seen a move like that at Nebraska in a while. I mean, you go back. 10 Okie State. Tommy Hill, you know, Travis Fisher, he made a comment in August where he said he's got enough talent where his name could be on this building someday. <laughs> you know, like, wow. Like, that was on the record. Uh -huh. and, and now he's playing receiver wearing Isaiah Garcia Castaneda's yeah. jersey. Yes. You know? So it, it, it's quite a turn on, on Tommy Hill, um, how fast they moved him to positions. Then how about Brandon Joseph? Bam, they call yep. him uh, coming in. He's 24 years old, wearing 24. I mean, he's a seventh-year <laughs> dude. Yeah. If you would have told me those are the two corners closing out a victory against Rutgers yeah. in the sixth game of the year, I mean, it's simply an amazing story how much that secondary has turned over and, and they're playing at a high level. And let's not forget about Michael Clements coming in, mm -hmm. playing that whole second half for the most part, um, was buried a little bit on the depth chart, moved his way up, and, and now playing meaningful time. Yeah, it's... That you that I'll give credit to to uh, Barrett Barrett yep, Rude sure. linebacker coach and and just development you know he's he's played a decent amount on special teams the last couple of years but it's it's one thing to play special teams and all of a sudden you get thrown in the mix and it's yeah. eleven on eleven and uh, you're it's live bullet action against another offense um, you saw him on the in the player broke down you know he's he's blitzing off the edge did a good job of kind of holding up that tackle and keeping feist free so mm -hmm. you know you get props to him for keeping his head into it. Um, paying attention in meetings and, and paying attention in, in, in practice as well because he didn't probably get a whole lot of reps. Yep. You know, ones will get, you call it 75% of the snaps during the week. Twos probably get 20, you know, the other 25. So um, good job by him preparing the right way to come out there and, and to make a mark in that game. What do you think about the rotation of the defensive, the outside guys, the, yeah. the rushers? They played five total in the game. What would you think about that? Yeah, he, it, it's interesting because it wasn't like because um, you want to play every down. I'm you do. Guessing as you a do. You do. I don't know how many total snaps you know the defense played on on Friday night. Uh, it's it's rare. Usually you have four. You know you you one each guy two and two, mm -hmm. um, and you have your majority of guys. I, I would think Garrett Nelson and Mathis would get the majority of them, but they were. They were they were running run them in and out, and it wasn't like the Rutgers just sitting back there throwing it 60, 70 times. Mm -hmm. So I like the idea, keeping them fresh, but also. I think they're just trying to find guys to because it really hasn't. Caleb Tanner and Mathis have been pretty good against the run, but other than other than Garrett Nelson, in my opinion, he's the only one that's kind of made his mark on rushing the pass on the edge. We haven't seen Mathis really right. get after a guy. He's had some good rushes here and there, but Nelson's the only consistent guy, in my opinion, that's got up to the quarterback through these first you know six games. So maybe they're just trying to say, hey, we see you guys do it in practice, so you guys earn your time, and now let's see if you can do it in the game. And they're trying to find a guy who can step up in meaningful time to, to make a play. Mathis ended the game strong. He had a pressure, a sack, and then he had that batted ball that was called a P.I. and then reversed because he batted it. Nice and fourth I, quarter. I had a really good view of that play, and I almost couldn't believe the officials didn't see I, that. I did not see the ball's yeah, wobbling. I, mean, like, yeah. I was like, oh, my gosh, like it's obvious, and they, yeah. they, they threw the flag. That, that was a pretty – 
flag happy crew. Play, but it was yeah. the same crew that did the Buffalo game last year. Oh wow! And you know they, they had a lot of ball miss spots in that game. They had a lot of ball miss spots in this game, and yeah. there were definitely four OPIs. I mean, it was a heavily officiated game, and they missed one of the easier calls. I thought at you the end of the game, hear, there you can hear a yeah. ball get yeah. tipped, especially, especially at, when the place at is Rutgers, right? Yeah. At, Ru at Rutgers, where there wasn't, yeah. a, they're not, they're on offense, not a ton of crowd noise. So that was, uh, yeah, that was one of. Uh, many uh, screwy calls in that game. Sean, Coach Joseph said there is no such thing as momentum. We all know that momentum sometimes is just players feeling confident because they're winning. What do you think about winning these two and what's going to matter going to Purdue? Well, they have confidence. I think if they would have lost any of these games against Indiana or Rutgers, your feeling is different. And I know the spread is 13, whatever it is, 12, 13 points right now. So Nebraska is a decisive underdog this week. But I, I think you could sense that guys have a belief that, hey, we can go in there. I mean, everyone's played Purdue tough. It's not like Purdue is blowing out people. Mm -hmm. uh, but Purdue has been an underdog two weeks in a row and won against Maryland and Minnesota. Uh, it's going to be the toughest atmosphere they're going to face this year other than Michigan. Um, so I think going on the road this week, I mean, they've got to have a whole different mentality because they haven't seen anything like they've seen that they're going to face this week in West Lafayette. Jay, I'm pretty sure you played in the last time Nebraska won a game as a double-digit underdog. Colorado, sure you, 2005. Colorado, was yeah. seven, I was just thinking about that. What about Michigan State, the Mike Riley year? Were they no, it was only three points. It was only three points. So that wasn't a lot. Even though, even though Nebraska was they what, lost three and six. They lost to Purdue the week before. Yeah. Yeah, and Michigan ended up making the Final Four that year. Yeah, Michigan State was – yeah, they yes, were really good, State, but yeah. the line – That was a double it. digit. No, it was wow. only – I think it was only like three and a half. It was a small number, but the game, 17 yeah. points – Colorado went in there, Joel Klatt, yeah. really didn't have a whole lot of offensive talent, and then that was the game at the end where yeah. that's why we did what we did. Restore the Restore order. Restore the order shirts, yeah. That's the last, <laughs> think about three. that, 2005. Well, Michigan, the Alamo Bowl, they were double digits in that, weren't they? Mm -hmm. Same year. The last time they were double digits, that they okay. won a game. I'll have to look at my field still, because I think they, they, that, that Michigan they won Alamo a game. Bowl, they were pretty big dogs in that game. Yeah, I don't think it was that much. It's I think funny, it might have been player, seven. We never paid attention I know you to, didn't, yeah. to the line. Sure. But uh, I swear, for that hey, game, no. <laughs> well, for that game, I mean, 17 was a ton. I remember, you know, working radio at the time. Right. You, they had Joel Klatt, they had a little shifty running back, uh -huh. and they had a tight end, and that yeah, was it. Joel Kloppenstein. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Just played lights out. And Corey yeah, Ross was, was deadly on the back. He was really good on that. But, those you know, routes. it's obviously tough to do, but we're going to talk about Purdue a little bit later. I have some numbers. They're not dominant. They're not great. They're a pretty average team for the most part. And as you said earlier when we were talking about the prediction, they can't run the ball. They're pretty banged up. I mean, they're on their third running back, Charlie Jones, their star receiver. I mean, he basically only plays in games and doesn't practice all week. Mm -hmm. He's in six-year senior as well that yeah. I think he came to Purdue with injuries from Iowa he did Aiden O'Connell's been injured I mean so th this is a team of older guys that are all you know fifth six-year players that have been around the block they know how to play football um, but I think their bodies are beat up so if Nebraska has a chance I think they've got they've got to take advantage of some of these things and, and they got to figure out a way to run the ball this week I mean, yeah that, that, that's going to be the biggest key and it's not going to be easy as Purdue is one of the better rushing defenses in the conference and take the numbers out of their win over Southern Illinois whoever they beat they're not as good they're not Indiana State that's what it is take take the numbers away they're not as good uh, time to dive into the highlights from Friday night's matchup in Piscataway Mickey Joseph on the sideline having a good time enjoying not early though because Noah Vedral goes after Malcolm Hartzog here that's what happens when you have a smaller corner obviously he made up for it later this is a great run by Vedral mm -hmm. he's, you can tell he's protecting that hand too a little bit they missed a holding call out there on Rymer's <laughs> they did miss the holding call. That is very true. And then overran the play right there, and, and Vedro getting a little bit of revenge uh, for, against his old team, which we'll see that the opposite way coming up. And here's the block punt, overloaded, overloaded one side. Again, it's just a numbers thing, and it's just it's funny that you see more and more people taking advantage of the rug, rugby, you know, style punt. You know, the teams love the rugby, you know, because they can start the the linemen can take off as soon as the ball snapped. Unlike the NFL, where you have to wait until the ball's kicked. Yep. And you look at there, uh, we mentioned it, that Gunnarsson tackle saves four points. They make the field goal. It makes it 10 nothing, but it easily could have been 14 nothing if Blaze Gunnarsson would have made the great play that he made. And then Noah Vegel again. Uh, we mentioned it earlier, what he was doing, going after different people. But here he is getting outside. Uh, that was one of those tackles we yes. talked about. Yep, there's one of those guys in the right spots. you got to just make the play. And I get it. You're going you're gonna to miss some tackles. You know, those guys are on scholarship too. But you, you got back there a couple yards behind the line of scrimmage. you got to get them down. 40-yard field goal is good there. Now it is 13-nothing. Nebraska trailing. I know a lot of fans probably were nervous at this point. Here's Casey Thompson' best uh, little run they had in the first half, John. Yeah, it looked like they were really going to put points on this drive before halftime, and then I believe the offensive pass interference might have happened on this on this possession because 
uh, Nebraska was well on their way to, to you know getting points on this drive. Yeah, that great play to Anthony Grant right there. And then this is a pressure. There was no blocking by the right tackle. Wide open, he makes a bad throw. And Oliver Martin, I've said this several times, he's got to try to break the pass up. I, I know that it's tough, but he's got to try to break that pass. Yeah, he got a little, his body got a little twist and turn, but a similar situation, I believe, in the Northwestern game, Oliver Martin could have broke, broke up that. Yeah. Northwest, yep. got a few of them. Mm -hmm. uh, here's Anthony Grant again out of the backfield. Great day for him. <laughs> Six catches out of the backfield for 46 yards, runs over to the defensive back right there, and it leads to a throw to get inside of the 10-yard line, which is a tough catch by Trey Palmer, and then you broke down the yeah, pop pass. Love it, yeah. You get the pull, good play action, and good ball handling by, by Casey. Thompson there to get both away. Kyler Reed caught about three of these mm -hmm. during his career, that quick pop pass. We have a guy that big, that's one thing. I don't know if he'll play this week, but not having him out there would be tough. And then one of the three interceptions, you were talking, bam, right there making the play, Sean. Yeah, Brandon Joseph, uh, the UCF Florida State transfer. I mean, just showed up at campus August 8th. That's incredible. Let's get the ball to Chancellor Brewington more, in my opinion. Uh, that's a great play there. Later, another pass was thrown a little bit behind him, but uh, he's a playmaker whenever he touches the ball and when he blocks. Um, this was a tough one right here. Uh, everybody knows fourth and one. You got to sneak it. You got to run it. But they decide to throw the ball, and Mickey Joseph stands behind Mark Whipple for that. Another of the interceptions. I thought Miles Farmer had a really good game. Yeah, really good job here. Hartzog, you bring the, the we call that the cat blitz or a, a, a boundary blitz, and right. he steps in to replace his you know, Hartzog and, you know, just wasn't expecting to come down there, but a really good play. Sudden change offense. Go after him with a, a shot play. They do that. Trey Palmer with the big catch there for the touchdown. Um, 24 of 36 for Casey Thompson. 232 yards, two touchdowns, two interceptions, but only the one sack, as Sean said earlier. And then here's uh, our play of the game. One of the plays of the game, Malcolm Hartzog makes the play there to end the game for the most part. Final stats coming up now. You look overall at the way Nebraska played. Really, they, they in my mind, the second half was so dominant. Even though you see all the numbers for Scarl for um, for Rutgers, it never really felt like in the second half they could get anything going to me. So, but anyway, our players of the week for the past game on the offensive side of the ball, not a surprise. Travis Vokalek, who of course is banged up now, got his first catch for a touchdown against his old team, against Rutgers, pretty cool. And then we mentioned earlier, Malcolm Hartzog repeats again as a defensive player of the game after battling through a tough first half to snag this game ceiling interception. Next up on the show, we'll be joined by former Husker offensive lineman, Jeremiah Searles. We'll talk more about the game as we go to break. Images from the winning road trip, courtesy of Hale Varsity. Stay with us, we're back soon. I'm proud of our players, the way they respond to the last two games. 
they found a way to win. You know, hats off to the coaches also. You know, you can preach staying on course, you know, but, um, you know, working hard, you know, and making things happen, you know, you, you got to practice that way. You got you got to practice to make things happen. And, you know, tell them today, you know, we got we to gotta make sure we're finishing on every play and every drive. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, we've done a good job just making adjustments throughout the game and uh, at halftime especially. And then uh, just when we come off the field, we're just, you know, taking it series by series and moving on right after the last series. So I think that's been huge. The locker room at halftime, they were kind of coaching us. They were saying that, that we were going to be okay, that they were going to come back and win the game. So what we were doing, we were doing corrections and, and getting the game plan on the board. They was like, no, coach, everything's going to be okay. We're going to come back and win the game. So they had a sharp memory. They know, hey, we played it. We're going to get it to the full quarter, and then we're going to finish. But they did it on their own. We want to we build a culture of winning around here, but we have to focus on the process and uh, winning on a daily basis. So we're just focused on taking one day at a time and uh, one week at a time. And I think uh, since Mickey Joseph has taken over, he's done a good job of just uh, allowing us to focus on the task at hand and not get too ahead of ourselves. So before we could talk about, you know, any end of the season awards and accolades and goals, we're just trying to take one day at a time. But it's good for us as a team and as a program to get two wins under our belt, and we're looking to uh, continue that win streak. We talked to him about it. nobody's going to win the West October 15. So it's, next, it's the next game up. You know, the job is to go one and zero this week, but nobody's going to win the West on October 15. So we're not looking down the line. We're looking at straight at Purdue. Welcome back to Big Red Wrap Up. I'm Michael Severe, Jay Moore, Sean Callahan, of course, and now we're joined by former Husker Jeremiah Searles. Jeremiah, we appreciate you being here. How you doing, man? I'm doing fantastic. Thank you guys for having me back. Well, we appreciate you coming back on with us. Two wins in a row. What was the feeling you had after watching that Rutgers game? You know, it was a mixed emotion because the first half was just kind of like, man, this can't be actually happening, you know, and I will say this. I think I gave Rutgers less credit than they deserved for the environment. You know, I think that was a pretty good environment that they had up there. But watching the Huskers battle, watching the defense be able to bounce back and then watching the offense have to make plays when they needed to, you know, it was really encouraging because this team for so many years has found ways to squander games at the end of the game or ways to not pull it out, even if it is a close game. And to see them do that two weeks in a row now and come away with victories was just really encouraging for everyone involved. Jeremiah, um, this is Sean Callahan. I know uh, you watch the offensive line play close. The Huskers have had some setbacks with the Prohaska injury, Nuri Noelli suspension. Uh, but what can they do right now to, to fix this unit? Is there one or two things that jump out to you right now that can get this thing at least in a better direction this week? You know, I think the Hunter Anthony fix at right tackle has been helpful. You know, he didn't play perfect by any means, but I think that he's playing better than Bryce <clears throat> Benhart um, at the moment. Uh, you know, I think that we're still trying to find who's going to be at guard. Is it Henry Lutovsky? Is it Brock Bando? Is it Ethan Piper? You know, right now the two steady guys are Turner Corcoran and Trent Hickson. Trent Hickson. And Turner getting asked to move outside to left tackle after playing only left guard and <clears throat> remembering that he had no offseason because he had the shoulder surgery and then he got dinged in camp. You know, he's had to move around a lot. So that's been really tough for him. But I think that this offensive line, what I want to talk about, and I talked about on our podcast with Jessica Cootie this week, I just need to see them be more nasty. You know, offensive linemen, we're just not nice people on the field. And I need to see more of that out of them. I need to see more guys wanting to throw guys around, finishing guys over the pile, not letting them touch your quarterback. You know, there's a mindset that comes with offensive line play. And I need to see that more out of these front five. I kind of saw it with Turner Corker <laughs> against, uh, against the Indiana, yeah, that's unfortunately. True. But, <laughs> but uh, it didn't work out too well for him. Uh, Jeremiah, how, do, how does – Play calls early set the tone for off, uh, offensive linemen's mindset. You know, you want to give your offensive coordinator so much confidence to be able to run the football early because, Jay, as you know, like mm. if you don't run the ball early, your offensive coordinator panics. You know, <laughs> if he comes out on first down and you have a negative play and then it's second and 11 and then the next drive you have a plus one play and now it's second and nine, you know, he starts to think early in the game, man, we're not going to be able to run the ball which is not the case. You know, the run game takes time to develop, but you just have to come out of the gate strong. And as an offensive lineman, you always want to give that confidence to your offensive coordinator and your run game coordinator. Like, we can do this. And it doesn't have to be home run hits, but plus threes, plus fours, because if you can start the game with plus three, plus four efficient runs, those turn into the plus eights, the plus nines. And when you have a back like Grant back there, 
who just loves contact and you can see him grow stronger during the game, it gives you a ton of confidence in offensive linemen because you're like, man, it, all it's going to take is one little hole and this guy could go the distance. You know, I was lucky enough to have some really special backs when I played here from Roy Helu to Rex Burkhead to Amir Abdullah. And, you know, since Divino Zigbo, I think Anthony Grant's probably our most mm -hmm. complete back that we've had since him that can do it both out of the um, shotgun, under center, in between the tackles, outside the tackles. So you just want to keep a guy like that in the game as much as possible. And as an offensive lineman, you just want to block as hard as you can for a guy like that. Jeremiah Searles joining us here, former Husker. I'm not saying it ever happened to you, but if you give up 26 pressures, what do you say to your quarterback after the game? I don't know what you say to him. I mean, you find a hole and you crawl in it and you don't get out of it for a really long time. You know, yeah. it's just, it's, it's, it's a, it's a pride thing. And you know, so much of offensive line play is confidence. And, you know, I think that's one thing that is lacking with some of these guys right now is just the confidence. You know, when you line up and you break the huddle and you walk up to that line, you have to look that guy across from you and say, I'm going to whip your tail mm. every single play. You know, I, you just have to. You have to have that mindset. The second doubt creeps in or the second you start trying to play him instead of making him play you, that's when things can really go off the rails. And, you know, I think some of the guys just are going out there and they're playing a little slow and trying to read and react instead of just doing their thing. Trust in your set. Trust in your footwork. Making that guy react to you and making him find ways to beat you instead of you working, hey, he likes to spin or he's a speed rush, so I change my set or whatever it may be. But, you know, you just apologize to your quarterback and you just say, I got to get better. And this is a performance-based business. I mean, whatever position you play, if there's someone playing better behind you, they're going to get reps and they're going to get an opportunity. Jeremiah, just six games left, but only one ranked opponent on that final six for Nebraska. What is your outlook when you look at these final six conference games and, and maybe what this team can accomplish uh, based on what you know about the teams they're playing right now? Yeah, you know, everything's out in front of us. You know, I'm not going to sit here and pound the table and say we're going to go win the West because, you know, that I think that's a tall, tall ask. But I think it's really <clears throat> possible that we can go three and three in these next six. I really do believe that. You know, it starts this week against a Purdue team, but you look at it, you know, Minnesota had their blunder. Uh, Wisconsin had their blunder. Iowa's offense looks like pious. You know, it's just one of those things where you have a lot of opportunities here, but as much as what the schedule says, it's more about what Nebraska does. You know, have they're going to be able to get the run game going? Are they going to be able to get to the quarterback? Little things of the game within the game of what Nebraska has done over the last two weeks, they have to learn how to handle winning. The worst thing this team can do is start feeling themselves a little bit. They have to learn how to handle winning, understanding where they're at as a team and growing off that and building momentum throughout the weeks. If they start, if they show up to Purdue thinking, oh, we won two games, we're fine, they'll get ran out of the stadium. And that's hard to do for a team that's just not used to handling winning. The media asked uh, Coach Joseph today, what's the difference on defense? He pointed out the change in defensive coordinator. What have you seen on the field that has led to these couple of second halves where they gave up zero points? You know, I think that you, they were playing tighter coverage on the back end. You know, I think that you're seeing guys get up and challenge guys quicker. You know, I know that Rutgers quarterback situation was less than ideal, to say the least. Um, but I thought that I'm really with against Indiana, especially these corners were up in their face, not giving as much separation. And, you know, it's a risk reward game because you're playing the if I get beat off the line, I might give up something deep. But I think we have enough talent up front that we can affect the quarterback and affect his timing. But, you know, for those few free games, you just saw wide receivers with so much cushion and just it was like they were playing catch out there. You know, it wasn't contested catches. It was a lot of five yard separations from the corners and backpedaling off the snap, you know, so I really like what these DBs have done the last couple of weeks and I'd like to see more of that sometimes you don't know you can do something until you do it Nebraska finally wins a one score game what do you think the difference overall was in the way they played in that fourth quarter no like back to back you know kind of way they played in fourth quarter of these last two games you know, the biggest thing is turnovers, you know, turnovers win you football games and on both sides, you know, protecting the football and then getting and stealing possessions. Anytime you can steal a possession, especially in enemy territory, and then take the deep shot and score right away. You know, those are momentum swings. Those are things that really give you confidence. And I think that that's something that's going to be pivotal going forward. Our offense is not built to go 90 every single time. You know, this defense has to steal the football away and gives this offense a chance to have a short field and have the ability to score. And I think that that was really 
helpful both weeks here. You know, we had some turnovers against Indiana too, but the big ones against Rutgers. But you, I heard you guys mention it before I jumped on here. The number one thing that's got to happen is the run game's got to get figured out. Mm-hmm. This is not a team that can win a lot of football games rush, rushing for 75 yards. Not as you enter into the teeth of your schedule, not as you enter into the batter weather as late October and through November. The run game's got to get figured out really quickly. Jeremiah, as we wrap it up here, um, what are your thoughts on Mickey Joseph and the job he's done considering the situation he inherited where the season was at um, after Georgia Southern and Oklahoma? You know, I think he's done a great job of you can tell he's not coaching with a lot of pressure on him because he doesn't have it. And I think the team's embodying that. You know, I think there was this unspoken pressure that was on the football team at the beginning of the year, you know, with all the the rumors going on of it's Coach Frost going to get fired or not. And then the the negotiation of the buyout where it's basically like, well, if he does bad, when he's going to get this. And I think that the team kind of felt that stress where it's like, man, if I don't play well, my head coach might get fired. You know, to where right now, I think the team and I think Mickey Joseph and I think all the coaches are kind of playing with house money. You know, there's a, no certainty to anything. There's more uncertainty than there is answers. So everyone's out there just playing much freer. You know, and I think Coach Joseph's done a great job of kind of letting his team feel that and saying, hey, go play loose, go play fast, Don't, go play with nothing to lose because we have nothing to lose. You know, and you're seeing the team play that way. And you're, you can win a lot of games off of effort alone. And I think that if they can continue off that and just embody what their head coach is preaching to them and really buy in, then I, I really think we can win three out of the next six. Former Husker Jeremiah Searle is joining us here on the wrap-up. Who's Maybe it's Co, but who's your offensive MVP? It's Grant. I think Grant right now is my offensive MVP. You know, I think that what he did early in the year, um, you, you see the specialty to him. You know, I think that it's – I'll go Co with Trey Palmer. Yeah. You know, those two guys make this offense go. You know, without those two guys, you, we'd be in a world of hurt. And, you know, those two guys are really, really special players. And, again, transfer portals, fresh year. I'd love to see both those guys stay another year and figure themselves out. Mm. And, you know, I just think that those both those guys can be really special talents. And we just have to make sure we get the ball in their hands more. Jeremiah, they had the deadline for putting uh, your name into transfer portal. Isaiah Castaneda decided to do it. What, what do you think the feel is on a team when you have a guy – decide, hey, I'm, I'm not going to say quitting, but leaving the team in the middle of the year? I mean, it's a weird thing. I, I was lucky enough that I got out before all that craziness <laughs> began. Yeah. Um, you know, but it, it's got to be a weird feeling to sit there and look your teammate in the eye and be like, really? Mm. Like, now? Like, you couldn't, you couldn't wait six more weeks? Like, well, what are you going to accomplish if you leave now? You know, I, do, I don't think it's quitting. And, you know, there's never – you never, never one never knows the full story as to what's going on, as to why guys leave, and no one ever really will. But, you know, for me, as a guy that thinks, like, if you commit to something, roll with it. If you're this deep into the season, man, finish it out, gut it out, find a way. The transfer portal's still going to be there in December. What have you seen from special teams – I know that was the big conversation coming into this season. Uh, obviously, Coach Bush took it over, and now it's, they're kind of sharing the duties a little bit. What do you think about what the special teams have done so far this year? I mean, our punter's been phenomenal. You know, I think that besides last week, he had some, he had some decently not great punts. Yeah. But overall, we flipped the field position this year, and our kicker's making extra points. I can remember standing on the sideline last year literally looking away for an extra point. <laughs> Like, just, like, close my eyes and just pray I didn't hear a double thud or a double doink. You know, it was an adventure every time the special teams walked out there. You never knew what was going to happen. And I think special teams actually been more of an asset for us this year. So what Bush, what Coach Bush did in the offseason, getting those things right, how they're sharing the duties now and everyone. And special teams is 90% effort and 90% a mantra. And I think that all of those guys are embodying just going down and flying around, playing fast, make things happen. And then the kicking game is just executing what they've been brought here to do. I'm interested on, on this. Who are the two or three best pro prospects on Nebraska's roster right mm. now, Jeremiah, based on kind of what you know and study from your end? Yeah, yeah. you know, I, I'm, I'm talking to scouts weekly. Um, and right now, Travis Vokalek is probably the top NFL prospect on our team. Mm. Um, Garrett Nelson's another one. And then Oshawn Math has had a decent grade coming into the year. You know, I think his play has probably dropped his grade um, a little bit on the way down. But you're going to see midseason grades will be coming out here probably in November um, you'll see here but I think that there's a few guys that are on there but I think Travis Vokalek's probably the top grade name right now and you know what pains me and kills me inside is we don't have an offensive lineman that is an NFL prospect and when guys talk about how do you become a better football team well you put NFL offensive linemen into the NFL you develop them you grow them and then you get them drafted and they go on and contribute and it's not a glaring thing where it's like why are we bad why are we struggling well you don't have NFL talent and the teams that have NFL talent win a lot more games 
Jeremiah, you want to tell folks where you got those cool glasses from? <laughs> I got these actually in, in Cincinnati. You know, I stare at a computer screen all day now that I don't bang my head against the wall. So I had to go get some blue blockers because I was getting a headache. So, you know, it's a fashion thing. I got to look hip for these kids that I'm recruiting nowadays. <laughs> I can understand. Jeremiah, we appreciate your time. Thanks, man. Absolutely, guys. Appreciate it. Go Big Red. All right, time for another break. Next up, Sean will help update us on recruiting. But first, more scenes from Nebraska's win over Rutgers, courtesy of Hale Varsity, back in two. Time to take a look around the Big Ten. Ohio State continued to cruise, this time over Michigan State, 49 to 20. Illinois fought off Iowa in a punting battle, 9 to 6. And Purdue really did hold on against Maryland, 31 to 29. Welcome back. Michael Severe, Sean Callahan. Time to talk some recruiting. Sean, has things kind of calmed down a little bit based off of what happened in terms of the coaching change? Yeah, I think they've won a couple games. The coaches have gone out and talked to almost every recruit. So. I think things for where the season's at have settled down. Obviously, we don't know what the coaching situation is going to look like, but I think Mickey Joseph and his staff have really done a good job, and they've made a lot of new offers as we've hit, we've hit on uh, the last couple of weeks. Let's talk to our guest now, Maverick Noonan, joining us, Melcorn South. Maverick, how are you doing? How's the season going so far? I'm good, undefeated, uh, ready to ready for playoffs in Omaha North. So I'm excited. Well, Maverick, um, you, you've been a commit now for, for a number of months. I mean, how do you, when you talk to Nebraska and just your role, um, how do they envision you playing in this defense going forward? Yeah. Uh, I'd say more of like a rush end. Uh, the easiest comparison I can make is somewhat of Garrett, how he's playing now and uh, getting after the quarterback, setting the edge and, uh, and making tackles on the line. We have you listed here on the screen at 230. Are you, are you 230 or are you more? I'm a little bit above that. What do you think? What do you think the ideal weight for you is um, now, and then moving into Nebraska? Um, I'm not too concerned about now since I'm in season, but uh, I mean, whatever they want me to be at, I'll, I'll, I'll adapt. So um, I'm not too concerned on that now. Maverick, this group of recruits that is currently committed to Nebraska, it feels like you guys have a great relationship as a group. Uh, how much do you guys talk, and especially during the current times, just with some of the uncertainties with Nebraska, and, and it, it feels like as a group you guys have stayed together and, and nobody has left the recruiting class? Yeah, I mean, I mean, we're pretty close. I mean, we're always uh, talking to each other on the, on the midfield during the games and, and just getting to know those guys. I know the in-state guys pretty well, too. So, I mean, we're all pretty close, and I think we're all committed to the school rather than the coaching staff. So I think we're all still locked in. 
Everett, I know your dad played a long time ago, but growing up, did you realize how good he was in terms of <laughs> how good he was at Nebraska, then being a high draft pick? Did you, did you know about the legend of your dad? I mean, we didn't really talk about that too much, to be honest, so <laughs> he didn't either. So, I mean, not, we didn't really talk about it too much, no. You're having a great season, Elkhorn South. Uh, you guys haven't really been tested all year. Yeah. How much – you got a big one with Omaha North week nine, but the playoffs, I mean, how much are we going to learn about your team and, and how excited are you for those opportunities? Yeah, I mean, we really haven't – like you said, we really haven't gotten tested, but I think uh, Omaha North will be great just before the playoffs, and then I feel like people will see how good we are during the playoffs. I mean, we got a great uh, running back, Cole Ballard, yeah. great D-line, Noah Bustard, uh, Asha Murphy, Henry Prohaska. Carson Rodgers doing great at quarterback this year. So, I mean, I think I think we can go really far in the playoffs and, and hopefully make it down to Lincoln. One thing I noticed about you guys, your your fan base travels. The students really travel as well. How awesome is that to have yeah. that support anytime you guys are on the road? Uh, I, mean, I mean, it's great. I mean, just having those those guys, even though uh, the games really haven't been too close, is always good. So, yeah. And Maverick, there's a number of Elkhorn South guys on this Nebraska football roster and there's other Elkhorn South athletes all over the athletic department how much do you run into those guys when you're down here just whether they're football baseball track I mean I feel like there's Elkhorn South guys all over campus right now yeah I mean I always see uh see Teddy on the sidelines he always comes up says hello so I mean it's 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 cool I guess Maverick we appreciate it have a great rest of the year yep thank you yeah. yeah, I saw them play against Central, and obviously Central was undermanned, and they have a lot of guys, but their size is amazing. We're talking like 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six offensive line. Then you got him and, and the Prohaska at the time, and they're just a big, them big kids. Yeah, you know, they're, they're – and they're the depth they have. Yeah, like yeah. we said, nobody plays two ways unless you're – you know, Maverick Noonan plays offensive line, D-line. You've got to be that level of guy mm -hmm. to be a two-way player because Guy Rosenberg just has the numbers. He has the depth. Schools like Creighton Prep, Elkhorn South, they just have the luxury of having so many more kids out with great depth. Let's talk about Carter Nelson now, our in-state recruit. Yeah, 2024, Ainsworth tight end, Carter Nelson, uh, probably a high three-star guy when it's all said and done, but maybe a four-star talent. Just an all-around specimen of an athlete. Um, guy can run sub-11 in the 100. Mm. He high jumps like 6'9", 6'10". Um, you know, he, he's throwing the discus at championship level. You know, he, he is an all-around athlete. And I thought what he did in track this last year really showed that. Because it's hard to evaluate this true eight-man film. But he is by far the fastest, the biggest, the strongest guy on the field um, at the eight-man level. And... I don't know if we've seen an eight-man guy like this in the state of Nebraska in a long, long time um, with, that has the total package. He's also a great basketball player. Coach's kid. His mm -hmm. mom and dad both are coaches at Ainsworth. I know it's early, but looking ahead to Illinois, do you think it could be a big v recruit visit? Yeah, you know, and Malachi Coleman is going to make his announcement on the bye week. So on that, that week coming up, we'll have an in-state announcement. And I think Nebraska is where he's going to end up going. I mm -hmm. mean, we, we don't know that for sure, but I think Nebraska is in a good spot there. Uh, coaches will go out on the road of the bye. Uh, but, yeah, Illinois, um, you, you'll have a good number. I mean, with Vince Ginta and Mickey Joseph, they've really made a huge effort to continue to recruit at a high level and not, sh not at least show that, hey, we're, we're shutting this thing down. I mean, they're moving full steam ahead, uh, even at a higher level level honestly that we had seen before thanks sean be sure to vote on this week's sideline survey great the job mickey joseph has done so far through three games <coughs> and these numbers better be good yeah 49 percent excellent 49 percent good two percent say neutral and no one so far voting bad which makes a lot of sense make sure you visit the wrap-up website and cast your vote let's dive into another coaching candidate we've been doing this each week this week we're gonna look at matt rule who now is back on the, I guess, the list for college coaches now after getting fired at Carolina. We know what he did at Temple, taking over a team that was really bad, took a little while to get going, but got him going. And then he goes to Baylor, takes over after Art Bryles, gets them going as well, leaves a bunch of talent behind. What do you think about Matt Rule? You know, yeah, you can't really deny what he's accomplished at Temple and Baylor. Obviously, the pros didn't go well, but we've seen this happen, happen over before. the years. I mean, Nick Saban didn't get it done. Pete Carroll, his first try in the pros, didn't get it done. Mm -hmm. um, so it doesn't necessarily mean you're a bad coach. Um, but, you know, what he did at Baylor and Temple, it's hard. I mean, he had college game day come to a Temple-Notre Dame game, yeah. and they aired a Temple-Notre Dame game on ABC. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, he, he had got them at a high level. I think what you got to figure out, 
is he a true fit for Nebraska? Culturally, is he a fit for this job? Um, and does he want to coach? I mean, I, that's what we don't know. $40 million know. Dollars he has in his pocket right now. Is like, he paid for does it? he want to just jump right back into things or survey things? I do think that the opening jobs that are going to open this year aren't as good. I mean, Auburn might open. Nebraska's open. Wisconsin. Auburn's opening. Oh, they'll, they'll eventually open. Yeah, but, and Arizona State is a place that has a lot of talent if you want to go to a place that has a possibility to have talent. But a big blue blood job, there aren't yeah. a lot of them opening right. this year. At least that's the feel. <laughs> that can change, right. obviously. Hey, A&M might open. You never know. Oh, they have about $85 million. <laughs> $96 million is probably not going to happen. Yeah. Um, you've been both spots. Mm -hmm. Why do you think he couldn't get it done in the NFL? The NFL is just a different animal. You know, there are a lot of bad organizations out there in sure. the NFL. And there are a lot of owners and general managers that want to be so involved. And they're not football people. Um, I mean, this is, I always tell the story. Uh, when I was drafted by the 49ers in 2007, mm -hmm. picked in the fourth round. So that was back when it was a two-day draft early in the, uh, yeah. that was like, the, it was like the second or third pick that Sunday morning in, the, in that fourth round. I get a call about three or four hours later, we're having a party at my house from the Arizona Cardinals asking me to sign as an undrafted free agent. Wow, they didn't even know. They didn't even know I was drafted. They're I'm that like, guy at your fantasy football draft that's drafting Derek Henry yeah. in the fifth round. He's gone <laughs> so, already. So when you, people wonder why the Arizona Cardinals struggle so much <laughs> yeah. here, because they have their yeah. scouting departments bad. Like right. there's this, there's this. It's it's, <laughs> you, it's always you have the same uh, franchises that are that are successful. You know the the Steelers, the 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 Patriots. Packers, well, even the, the Niners keep yeah, coming the, around. So yeah. it, it all you have to have good management. There's a lot of bad management, and the head coaches truly aren't head coaches. They'll they'll undermine you. They'll go behind. It's it's a it's a messy business. And not to say the college is is squeaky clean, but the NFL you get some. The egos are substantial. Mm -hmm. um, you get the general managers and owners just want to say sometimes, just because you know the owners, you know they, they're funding the whole the whole thing, sure. uh, unfortunately. But uh, they, it's just it's just a completely different ball game. You mentioned cultural fit. This is a guy who left Temple and went to Waco, Texas, and won everybody over. I, I, he seems like the kind of guy that could go anywhere. Well, yeah, and I think a lot of it does he want to just jump into this? That's what sure. we don't know. Um, you know, does he want to sit out a year and kind of survey the land? Does he want to go back in the NFL, or is he done in the NFL and going back to college? Like, I think that those are the things that we don't know um, about Matt Rule yet because this just happened, you know, a couple of days ago on Monday when he was fired. Uh, but there's no – you can't deny what he did. I mean, getting Baylor to the – was it the Sugar Bowl they played in? Mm -hmm. um, and they, they lost but to Georgia. But yep. I mean, to get him at that level – um, you know, before he went to the NFL. I mean, he did a remarkable job at those places. We talked a lot about a little bit about Purdue earlier, and the biggest strength they have, just looking over stats-wise, is their red zone. Offense, 94% red zone scoring, which is great. And three out of the four times you score on them in the red zone, but that's pretty good. It's 24th in the country. 75% they're giving up scoring in the red zone. That's where their strength is, and that's yep. how they beat Maryland. Yep. We, we always reference this, this quote, right, from Bo Plain. It's not about yards, it's about points. It's about, that's right, ma'am. So <laughs> <laughs> and that's just that's the key. You know, if you hold teams to field goals, man, you get you give your offense a, a fighting chance every day. You know, it's you hold that's and it's a huge confidence booster too. And it's just as an offense, you drive, call it 75, 80 yards, and you hold the three, you're like, man, it's just it gets exhausting, and but that's just a huge confidence boost. That's where they, that's where they hold that. And then on the other side, their offense is really successful in, in the red zone. Yep. And how long for how, how many years was Scott Frost? Did we struggle inside the red zone? I mean, we'd drive up and down the field, but heck, we couldn't. Uh, we had one of the worst red zone scoring percentages there, uh, not only in the Big Ten but nationally with Scott Frost. So it's it can be, uh, it's a tough battle when everything gets tightened up uh, inside the 20s there. But you know, Purdue's done a good job this year. They have, and, and I, part of that is Brom is a great play caller, does a lot of really good things. O'Connell, we mentioned, he's been there six years. Or 16. 16 six. years. Um, he will give you a chance to intercept the ball. But you think the biggest key, though, is, as you mentioned earlier, is Nebraska being able to get the running game going? I think that's, yeah, because that takes pressure off the offensive line. And I felt like on Friday night they couldn't run it. So then it really made it obvious they had to throw it. And that's when the stunts, the movements, the blitzes could come in. And that offensive line is not built for that, as we know. But if you can give them second and mediums, third and shorts, where it run pass or both in play, I think it's a different line or can, can be a different line. Um, and they, they've got to figure out a way to give that offensive line a chance because if it's obvious, mm -hmm. Casey Thompson's going to get hit a lot again. No doubt about that. Howard says from Omaha for Jay, what will the team do to develop the defensive line take the next step with black shirts what can they do to develop it well it starts one with recruiting getting yeah. getting the guys in here but it's just 
it's it's hard to develop guys as well. We had this I had this discussion because when I came in, you know, I had Des Moines Adams, Chris Kelsey, Trevor Johnson. Um, I was not forced into a situation to play. Mm -hmm. uh, I was able to redshirt. Heck, I didn't play for my first two years. I developed. I, I finally started playing my sophomore year. Uh, I think nowadays, because a lack of depth and a lack of talent, where so many young kids are forced to play, and it's really hard to play as you know, 18, 19 year olds in the Big Ten up front. Mm -hmm. And so I think if they can, you know, get those guys to play and develop some other, maybe some, the 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 walk-ons maybe can, like the Colton, you get more Colton Feast that are able to step up and play. And they don't have to rush so many young kids into this. And they, you can, get, hey, put on 25 pounds, put on 30 mm -hmm. pounds, develop, learn the defense, learn to play with correct pad level, hand placement, good footwork, know what to look for in blocking assignments and learn pass rush moves. But it's, it's hard to do all of a sudden you throw this kid in there and all of a sudden they get out there and your confidence can get crushed in a, in a real quick as a young kid. So I think that's that's the biggest thing is to get the guys that you have, get them up to get up speed. But these young kids, you can maybe hold them back. And But that I mean, it's, it's hard to do when um, you're recruiting guys and you're, you're promising playing time early. I know you've heard it before, Sean, but Husker Hex. Every team that's played Nebraska obviously struggles since that Northwestern's not won a game since they beat Nebraska. Oklahoma's not won a game since they beat Nebraska. And Georgia Southern with one win. Even Indiana, after, you know, same thing, lost. Uh, it's tough when you play Nebraska. Hey, <laughs> they beat you twice. <laughs> they, do, they beat you twice somehow, which is amazing. 1-11 combined record, those three teams, after beating Nebraska. It is pretty incredible to think about. Real quick, um, why do you think Logan Smothers isn't playing? Why do you think Chubba Purdy's ahead of him? And do you think it's uh, a talent level thing, experience? Why do you think he's playing? I think it's arm strength. I mean, to make the throws that Mark Whipple wants, Chubba's got a better arm for him. And yeah. I, I know – Logan's a better athlete and he can run the zone sure. reads and things. We saw that. I'd like to know when they put him in that game, was that a Scott Frost wrinkle? Was that Georgia Southern or North Dakota where we saw him come in? Yeah. For I think he's on the, the face mask came in both games, didn't yeah. he? Northwestern as well. I think he came yeah, in. Yeah, because one you know. was a face mask, one was a good that one. That felt like a Scott Frost wrinkle at that yeah. point. So, and, yeah. you know, Chubba is Whipple's guy. You got to remember that. Right. Casey's Whipple's guy. Sure. Logan is Mario and Scott Frost's guy. So, they're, you know, th that's a reality of yeah. coaching roster politics. And you want um, Chubb to maybe stay next year as well. What do you got for your burning question? My burning question is, um, can, can this team go into a hornet's nest in West Lafayette, ross Age Stadium, a true sellout, not a, <laughs> yeah. not a fake sellout, as Mickey Joseph said today, um, and, 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 and handle themselves in, in a really tough environment? Jay? Yeah, Purdue do does struggle to run the football, but can Nebraska's defense stop the run? That's the biggest thing. Force them in the pass, passing situations, and then sit back there and hopefully uh, O'Connell gets careless with the football. When he does get careless with the football and he throws the interception, will Nebraska actually intercept it? That's the key to the game, I think. Don't forget to head to our website and click on the prediction. Jay, Sean, and I will tell you exactly what's going to happen on Saturday. Nebraska stays on the road again this weekend as they head to West Lafayette to take on the Purdue Burlermakers. Kickoff is set for 6.30 on the Big Ten Network. Of course, we'll be back next week to recap the game with our special guest, Sam McEwen from the Omaha World Herald. Awesome. On Sunday, Nebraska Public Media Sports is proud to present more Nebraska volleyball. The Oscars host Big Ten foe Northwestern to the Bob on Sunday. First serve is set for 2 p.m. Central. Catch all the action right here on Nebraska Public Media. Our thanks to Jeremiah Searles, Maverick Noonan, and our student volunteers in the call center for joining us tonight. For Jay Moore and Sean Callen, I'm Michael Severe. We'll see you next week on Big Red Rapper.